Now, the British Home Secretary, Suella Braverman, has penned a column for the Times, arguing that there is a perception that senior police officers are playing favourites when it comes to protesters. They can be very heavy-handed when it comes to some protesters uh, on the right side of politics, but they do not want to upset pro-Palestinian protesters, BLM, climate change activists, for example. What did you make of this uh, piece by Braverman? I thought it was um, a much-needed intervention. Um, uh, uh, Sue Braverman is one of the few brave people in British politics. Uh, she actually speaks for the majority of the British public, in my view. Um, and she's completely right simply on this issue of policing. You know, uh, we've seen in recent years, first of all, when the BLM protests went on in London, which which got very unpleasant, um, uh, we had mm. officers of the Metropolitan Police taking the knee when the crowd insisted <laughs> that they do so. And they actually did in that, you know, that gesture that people did at the time. Oh, yes. Uh, as a sort of cowing gesture. Um, they actually did that. We've seen Extinction Rebellion and other eco-loon protests where the police have actually... I mean, there was one protest, they shut down a bridge in London and there was video of a policeman actually sort of, like, getting on a skateboard and playing with the activists instead of wrenching them off the roads and getting them arrested. Um, there's no doubt that there's a double standard in policing, and we've seen it in spades in recent weeks with the anti-Israel demonstrations in uh, London and across the UK. You know, uh, um, people have been threatened with arrest if they go near these protests carrying an English or a British flag, because that would be, Rita, mm. inflammatory. Uh, but at the same time, the police <laughs> have stood idly by as people have called for jihad, for genocide and much more. It's an obscene double standard, but we can see why. One person, even, one police officer even said as much uh, last week on camera, uh, said, we're outnumbered here. So they are clearly that's intimidated it. by this mob. I think that's wrong. I think that Braverman is absolutely right to say there's a double standard and it has to change. And on the uh, climate change cultist, uh, we just uh, had Just Stop Oil step up their violent antics uh, with this act of vandalism at the National Gallery in London. They are becoming more destructive, Douglas. It used to be paint. Now they're taking sledgehammers to these paintings. It's unbelievable to view, of course. I mean, it's just appalling. This particular a painting that was attacked, the Rokeby Venus of Velazquez, um, was attacked before it was slashed in 1914 by a suffragette. And these, these um, vandals this week clearly felt they were treading in her footsteps. They hadn't quite done their research because the suffragette in question ended up joining up with Oswald Mosley's British Union of Fascists, which just goes to show, among other things, that the, <laughs> the path of history isn't quite as straightforward as some of these people would think. But, you know, watching them take these mallets and hands to smash one of Velazquez's great masterpieces. To, I mean, we don't know yet what damage they may have done to the canvas. They obviously repeatedly smashed the glass protecting this masterpiece. But to see them get away with this is a reminder of this is what happens if you allow a two-year-old child to keep pushing. You know, the two-year-old child will keep pushing mm. to get further and see what they can get away with. Well, it's just the same with these eco-vandals. You know, they, as you mentioned, Rita, they, 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 they threw soup over a Van Gogh painting in the same gallery, uh, two of them glued their hands to the 18th century frame in which another Van Gogh masterpiece was was uh, was hanging. And do you know how much those two uh, got fined eventually? £500 a piece. £500 a piece. Oh. So it turns out it's a bit of a bargain if you want to get your international <laughs> message across and create a, a, a little act of terror. It's quite a bargain to go in and assault the, the uh, completely... <laughs> I mean, guiltless collection of the National Gallery 
in London. It's it, but it, it's it's very cost efficient. It turns out so surprisingly enough, after they'd come with the soup and with the glue, the next time they came with their mallets and their hammers. I wonder what they'll use next time, unless your authorities stop them. Now, Douglas, we have uh, seen the left, which dominate the media, academia, much of the culture, completely redefine words, including the term far right. Anyone to the right of Karl Marx these days can be called far right. But there is a real far right. They may be small, but they do exist. And they are unsurprisingly in perfect agreement about many issues with the woke far left. And David Duke is an example of this. He's a defended Ilan Omar in the past. And this week came out strongly against Israel and Zionism. Yep, um, the former Grand Wizard, I think that's what they call themselves, uh, of the KKK, <laughs> David Duke, um, and uh, so, uh, a man who uh, represents the rump of the sort of far-right party in the UK, the British National Party, that has no influence in politics. Uh, the two of them came out in this statement on the side of Hamas and against the Israelis. It's a fascinating thing, because that, as you say, uh, Richard, that sort of awful, ugly um, rump of the actual far right that is so far away from any mainstream um, actually shares its views with the far left and with the Islamists. And one of the places that they, they all meet up is on the issue of the Jews. How very unsurprising. Yeah. Uh, but the, the, here's the difference, of course, is that everybody knows that they would run a million miles from having anything to do with David Duke, the former grand high wizardy wizard or whatever it is of the KKK. But how sad <laughs> that his views are in total alignment with a lot of airheads from the far left and the left in the US, in Australia and elsewhere. They're in total alignment with them when it comes to the issue of the mm -hmm. Jews. It's just that the left and the far left seem not to be able to keep their extremists at bay in the same way. It's a great shame for civilization and it's a great shame for the respectable left. Douglas, you are in Israel and earlier this week, you saw that 43 minute unedited edited video, including body cam footage of what happened on October 7. How has that affected you and has that changed your view on that conflict? Well, it, I mean, it's certainly unfortunately um, reinforced the number of thoughts I had about the Hamas attack. Um, I was uh, earlier this week in near Oz, which is one of the kibbutz that was completely ransacked, ravished, ravaged by by Hamas that day. Um, I think a lot of people from outside Israel haven't still haven't realized the sheer scale of the attack. It was a battalion sized attack of terrorists. And people like that small, beautiful community of near Oz, near the Gaza border, had 400 people living in it. Um, funnily enough, most of these kibbutz, or many of these kibbutz, these communities around Gaza, were filled with left-wing peacenik types. Uh, they wanted peace with their Palestinian neighbors, very often, um, you know, campaigned on this, did good deeds for their Palestinian mm. neighbors in the hope that this would incrementally lead to peace. Um, Niroz lost over 80 of its citizens to being kidnapped by uh, Hamas. They were stolen from their homes, uh, often having been horribly uh, tortured and taken into the Gaza, where some of them still are. Um, and more than 30 uh, people of that community uh, were massacred right there. Um, an elderly man burned alive in his house and um, um, much, much, much more. Um, I went round the what remains of the community uh, a couple of days ago, wrote about it for the New York Post today. And I urge people to just read about this, to confront it, because to confront it is to confront true human evil in our time. And it is to understand the basic Israeli message, which is we just cannot live with Hamas beside us when they do this, when they glory in it, and when they say, as one of their leaders again this week, that they want to do this again and again and again. It's impossible for the Israelis to live with that. Douglas Murray, thank you so much for your time this evening.
It's a pleasure to see you as always, Rita. Thank you.